Okay, this is uh, DSD for the 14th of October, uh, and we're going to review for the uh, test one written, uh, which will be tomorrow, uh, Friday. So here's the syllabus. So here we are on the uh, 14th review. Uh, I, I probably won't, not going to do anything on 7.1. We'll just start that on the 19th. And then on the 16th, we'll do test one. It's going to cover chapters two through four. So that's what you should be focusing on. You should, if you just go back over the lectures where we covered chapters two, three, and four, you should be in pretty good shape. Um, okay, so uh, having said that, then let's, um, let's look at, uh, here, I'll get rid of this. I think I'm just going to kill this. And then let's look at this. Well, let's shrink it down a little bit. Okay, and then we'll pop this over here. All right, there we go. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, so if we look at uh, the um, the blackboard for DSD, so hopefully uh, everybody is finishing up and posting your videos for practical uh, one. Uh, some of the videos in Dropbox were kind of hard. to. Uh, some of them worked fine. Some of them didn't. So make sure if you do a Dropbox that somehow I have access to it. I don't know how that works. I'm still confused about Dropbox. But anyway, um, it's easier to put it on Facebook, uh, YouTube, and give me, a, uh, give me the link. Uh, and you can also upload it directly uh, to Blackboard, and that works too. Uh, and some of the Dropboxes have worked flawlessly, but some of them... I, you know, I need some kind of log on and I can't figure it out. So uh, if you can avoid Dropbox, that would be nice. Or if you do Dropbox, make sure it's going to work. Uh, okay. Um, so, all right. So, yeah, I don't actually don't really need to look at the Blackboard, uh, Blackboard thing. So, okay. So fine. All right. So, um, I, I will make, uh, I know there's one on here that's, I think it's visible. Let's see, where is that? Uh, test one. Okay, we'll make that visible. Uh, make available. So you can at least look at that. Um, it, it, uh, it's not exactly like the test, but, uh, all right. So anyway, I'm going to get rid of this. Okay, so, um, so let me let me pull up a couple of these. So we'll we'll go through some things. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll just make this bigger. All right. So first off, um, and I maybe I'll put this over here. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually probably pretty good. All right. So so uh, so let me just go through some things. So first off, um, I'm not going to ask you to write any code. Uh, because we already did that. That's part of the practicum, and, and that's that's why I did it that way. Uh, and I do want everybody to make sure you finish that up. Uh, you've got till midnight tonight to get that in. If you don't get it in, uh, you know, at least turn in something. Uh, I have given you the complete code, uh, the constraint file, so there's really not too much left. Uh, it'd be nice if you would write most of your own code, um, but I, I'm sure some of you will probably paste in my code. So if you do that, t try and make some of it your original code, please. Uh, don't just cut and paste because you don't learn anything when you do that. Uh, you need to make some effort to try and do parts of it yourself. Uh, I don't mind it. You can copy. Uh, you can copy the constraint file. You can copy all the sub modules. That's fine. They were all part of uh, of uh, Lab Six anyway. But but uh, at least some part of your of, of your uh, say case statement try and do that yourself and then if you totally can't do it then then you can sort of look and see how I did it and you can sort of copy that but don't just cut and paste it at least type it in <laughs> so you have some experience and change the variables so you actually you know so you actually put a little thought into it now I know some of you put in a lot of effort and that's great uh, and and you will learn a lot if you do that the more you the more work you do the more you're going to learn Okay, um, that having been said, uh, so so you should know you should know operators in C. Uh, so I'll, I'll maybe I'll sw 
switch this over here we'll look at a few of these okay so so uh, operators in C so here's an example uh, a logically ended with B logically ended with C evaluates to uh, B tick or four tick B zero 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 one all right now I did have a question somebody asked me what are those what are those um, what are those what are those uh, those four tick H and four tick B so we went over this we went we did a whole lecture on on all the exigencies involved in creating constants. These, that, this is how you do constants in Verilog. Okay, you put a number. That's the number of bits. It's not the number of digits. So if you do hex, you do four tick h. That doesn't mean you get four hex bits. I mean four hex digits. It's still four bits. The first number is always the number of bits, and if you don't put it, it's assumed to be 32. Then you put a tick, and then you put the the radix. In this case, b for binary, h for hex, d for decimal, o for octal. And then you type in your number. And you should try and make the number of digits you type in correspond to the number of bits. So if you do if you do like uh, uh, if you do like uh, you know eight tick H, you should have two hex digits. Uh, it, because if you don't if you have more or less than and then uh, there's also issues with if you make it signed, it can get, get really crazy. So try and make sure you match up. Uh, match up the number of bits with the number of bits you actually define, whether it's in hex or decimal or whether it's in binary. Okay, uh, so so here are the original definitions. A is 0011, B is uh, is A, so that's 1010, and C is 0010. All right, so if we logically end A and B and C together, what do we get? And And this is true, we get 1. Because a logical, uh, a logical operator takes the arguments and, and only looks at whether they're zeros or something other than zero. If they're zero, it's considered false. If they're true, uh, if they're non-zero, they're considered true. And so this always returns only one of two possible outcomes. A logical, a logical operator always returns one of two outcomes, zero or one, nothing else. There's no in-between. You either get a zero or you get a one. You don't get all ones. You don't get F. You don't get. You just get zero or you get one. That's it. Okay. So obviously A is not zero, B is not zero, and C is not zero. So the logical and of these three always is going to evaluate to true or one. Next, B bitwise anded with C evaluates to zero zero one zero. Okay. Let's look. So B is one zero one zero. And uh, C is zero zero one zero. So the only so so the first one, the one zero, doesn't overlap with the one in here when you do it bitwise. So that's one ended with zero. That's zero. Zero ended with zero. That's zero. One ended with one. That's one. And zero ended with zero. That's zero. So it's obviously going to evaluate to zero zero one zero. Okay. Next, a tilde B is a bitwise inversion of B. So here's B. B is A. Anytime you inverse an A, you get five, and so it's going to evaluate to four tick. Uh, uh, X five. All right. So that's a good question. So what does the X mean? Okay. So this one's a little bit tricky, and but what you should see there is that. Uh, uh, that if you do a bitwise inversion of B, it should evaluate to four tick H five, not X five. The X means unknown, so that's really goofy. So what that's basically saying is um, an unknown bit plus. Uh, so there's there, so there's no radix specified. Um, so the. Uh, when the radix is not specified, it defaults to decimal. So basically, you're saying decimal x5. Well, so basically, that's uh, the first bit's unknown, and then you have 101. So that's what it defaults to. And that's not correct, because it, it actually, the, it, the tilde b, since b is 1010, turns out to be 0101. So the first bit is not x. So anyway, so that's false. Okay, not B is obviously zero, and four tick x zero. That's not correct either because the x is not 
a hex designator. So that's false. Uh, that would be unknown, but it's known. It's a zero. It's zero, 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 zero. Uh, e. Uh, a ORD with C evaluates to A. All right, so A and C, yes, it's going to be, uh, so A and C, no, so A and C does not evaluate to A. Uh, when you OR A and C, A is 3, C is 2, and you wind up with 3. So it evaluates to 3. Oh, well, that is A. My bad. So, yes, it does evaluate to A, so it's true. Uh, a, logically, OR with C evaluates to 1. Yes, that's right. Uh, one uh, shifted zero evaluates to B uh, four tick B zero 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 one. Yes, that's correct. Um, uh, explanation point A evaluates to zero. Yes, that's correct because it's a logical inverse. A is true, so the logical inverse is false, and that's always zero. Uh, if B bitwise and with C uh, begin and will evaluate to true and execute. So let's look. B uh, ended with C. So B is 1010 and C is one is 0010. So they overlap at a 1 in in the in this in bit position uh, 1 if you count the first position 0 0 1 2 3. So they both have a 1 in position 1. Therefore they will evaluate to true logically and uh, and but uh, so the, the they, they don't you're 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 bitwise anding them so you get zero zero one zero which is not zero so that would be true uh, and so therefore the if statement is true it does execute so that's true uh, a bitwise and with B evaluates to one zero zero one well uh, a a is zero zero one one and B is one zero one zero so what they're going to evaluate to is not uh, uh, one zero zero one that's incorrect their bitwise uh, anding is going to give you zero zero one zero for a and b and then um, let's see uh, then the last one here uh, a bitwise ended with uh, the bitwise inversion of C. So we take C, which is 0, 0, 1, 0. You invert it bitwise, so that's 1, 1, 0, 1. Then you're going to and it with with A, which is 3. So 1, 1, 0, 1. So that's only going to overlap in the lo lowest order bit. So that's going to evaluate to 4 tick B, 0, 0, 0, 1. That is correct. Oh, wait, it, uh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Mark with an X whether the statement is an advantage for an FPGA or an ASIC using uh, an F or an A. So, uh, so F means it's an advantage for FPGA, and A means it's an advantage for an application-specific integrated circuit, which would be just a regular integrated circuit or even a mass programmable in integrated circuit. All right, cheaper and small production runs, clearly an FPGA. Uh, if you're going to do lots and lots, you can afford to have the foundry uh, do these for you, but if you're not going to if you're not going to do lots, you you really can't afford to to go through the the cost of firing the foundry up to make your chips. All right. So, best choice for product where the clock rates are pushing the limits. If you really have to push the limits, in clock rates, then you probably do want to avoid an FPGA because the routing can be quite complicated and can screw up your timing since you're typically running your signals around a big, uh, you know, connection uh, interconnect matrix. Whereas in a in a dedicated chip, you're going to control the actual routing of every line, and you you know, or at least you can, and you need to uh, you need that then you can push the timing to the limits. Uh, have much smaller chip area for the same circuit. So obviously, uh, chip area is large for an FPGA because you have to include all the programmability um, uh, hardware. So, so that would be an advantage to the uh, to the uh, uh, ASIC. 
uh, usually take longer to get a product to market. Yeah, if you're going to have to have the foundry involved, it's going to take longer. If you can just buy off-the-shelf parts, program them on your bench, you can certainly do that a lot faster. Best choice when multiple prototypes are planned. Yeah, when you're prototyping, uh, you sure don't want to be running through an entire um, uh, tool up uh, for a foundry to do a, a production run uh, for a single chip or two. Uh, that would be just prohibitive. Will likely be cheaper in very large production runs. Okay, that would be an ASIC. Uh, clearly, the uh, in large production runs, the FPGA is going to get pricey because they're, they're going to be more costly per chip uh, than what you can make to do the same thing. Um, all right, best choice where ability for field updates and changes are required. Okay, no choice. You have to have an FPGA. Best choice where clock skew would not be a big problem. FPGA, if you don't care about uh, a little bit of uh, clock skew, which means your clock gets goes through a longer path uh, and might be delayed just slightly, then 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 you you're perfectly happy with uh, the the, uh, the synthesizer routing your clock in some circuitous way through the uh, interconnect matrix. So that's that's clearly true. Um, <clears throat> best choice where all the work must be in house for security reasons. Yeah, if you're going to do that, then you, then an FPGA would be nice. Best choice where the target is a large consumer market looking for the cheapest price point. Okay, so now if you're going to sell lots and lots of them, you're going to go with a dedicated chip. Um, all right. How big would a ROM have to be to hold 300 twos complement integers that could vary from minus 100 to plus 100? Well, okay, so uh, it's a good question. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, first we take the log base 2 of 300. We'll find that uh, that the nearest power of 2 is going to be uh, is going to be 512 because 256 is too small. So we have to double that. That's 512. So 512 is going to have uh, nine. Uh, address lines uh, and uh, and then uh, so so we need at least uh, 300 locations to store them but how many bits do we need to hold plus or minus 200 well that's plus or mi plus uh, minus 100 plus 200 I'm uh, sorry minus 100 to plus 100 so that's 200 things and so or 201 things actually counting zero and so as a result um, we need 256, so that's 8 bits. So you need a byte, uh, and we need uh, 512, 512. So how many address lines? 9. How many output data lines? 8. How many rows? 512. How many columns? 8. Same as the output data lines. Okay, what questions should you ask when you decide for either a, a read-only memory, a, a standard factory programmable, an erasable programmable read-only memory that would be, say, ultraviolet erasable, electrically erasable, electrically programmable read-only memory, or a flash, which is also an EEPROM. Does it need to be reprogrammed? So, yeah, you would want that. You'd, you'd want that. Um, yeah. Well, you'd, you, yeah, you definitely want to know that before you decide what technology you're going for. So, yes, that's true. You need to ask that question. Do we need to change individual locations? Yeah, if you're going to do flash, you can't change individual locations. If you're going to do a factory programmed ROM, you can't change individual locations. But with an EEPROM, uh, with an EEPROM, you can't do that. You can't erase individual locations. You have to erase the whole chip. But with an EEPROM, you can. So yeah, you definitely want to ask that question. Do we need the cheapest technology for a very large production run? Yes, that's another good question. Uh, you would probably want to ask that and make sure that uh, that you. Uh, order to read only memory if you were going to do that because you don't need to reprogram it and you want to get the cheapest you can and it's going to be a very large run. So then that would justify factly programming. Um, is size a critical issue? That's probably less of a question. Um, how many IO pins will we need? Yeah, you, that's also uh, something you might want to ask uh, whether you're going to get it uh, connected by, say, I squared C or whether you're going to have a parallel interface to it. And does it uh, have to work underwater? It doesn't have anything to do with these. Uh, you just have to, that has to do with uh, uh, sealing it up nice and tidy. Um, okay, answer a few questions about the Nexus 4 board. How fast is the onboard clock? Well, I'll leave that to you to figure out. You should already know. Uh, mark with an X. The FPGA has about how many pins? It has 325 pins, but uh, but a bunch of them are power pins. Um, 
but it does have 325 pins. And by the time you subtract off the power pins, you still have quite a few uh, GPIO pins that you can utilize. Our constraint file typically uh, has typically set the I.O. pins up for which standard? Uh, usually low voltage CMOS 3.3. Uh, That's what we typically have been using. How many slide switches and LEDs are available for use total? Okay, so there's, there's 16 slide switches and 16 LEDs. Plus then uh, there are some R RGB LEDs as well. So that was a little bit of a goofy question, but um, I was basically thinking about 16 plus 16 equals 32. But you do have, uh, I think there are actually two R RGBs uh, LEDs, as I recall. Yeah, there are two. So you could add another six if you wanted. Um, all right, uh, so bad question, really. How many control lines go to the row of eight seven segment displays? So that's a good question. So how many control lines do you need for, for all uh, eight seven segment displays? Well, you need, uh, you need eight control lines for the segments and eight control lines for the common anodes. So you need 16. Uh, the question is not stated in a great way though. Uh, what are some of the major steps in the design flow to get your code actually working? Well, so if you look at uh, if you look at the uh, uh, at, at uh, Vivado, you should be able just to go through that. But obviously, uh, we can we can uh, we can elaborate the design. We can uh, simulate the code. We can uh, synthesize the code. We can do a post synthesis simulation. Uh, then we can, uh, then we can um, uh, uh, implement the design. We can do the placing, uh, the mapping, placing, and routing, uh, and then we can generate the bitstream, uh, and then we can program the board. Uh, we use files with each lab project in Vivado. What file uh, connects the top-level ports to actual pins? That's this constraint file, right? And in fact, where do you find out whether the pin's an input or an output? You find that in the top module's port list. What file is the main module? What file has the main module and submodules? Well, that's your source file. Um, unless you have multiple source files, and then you'd, you'd have to talk about that. What is the file that is written? To the Nexus 4 board. Well, the, the file that's written to the board is the is the .bit, the .bit file. Uh, which file is used to run the simulation? You use the test bench, and then you instantiate your top-level module. Uh, there are two ways to list variables when you instantiate a sub-module. Yes, there's the positional notation, and there's the name notation or dot notation. Um, here's an example, instantiation. Which type of instantiation is used here? Well, since there's no dots, it's not the dot notation. It's, it's not the name notation because there's no names in parentheses. So that's obviously positional. Okay, answer the following about always blocks. The left-hand signals in an assigned statement have to be wires. No, that's... Uh, oh, yeah. The, well... Yeah. Okay, bad question. If it's inside an always block, they have to be registers. But if it's outside an always block, they have to be wires. Okay, the uh, the at star is typically used in blocks that result in sequential logic. No, they typically use them in blocks that result in combinational logic. The always at pause edge clock comma set not. This statement has a problem. Yeah, you, you your set not must also be an edge signal. And so you have to specify that. Uh, I know some some at least one student said they had problems using the push button, even calling it an edge. I'm a little confused about that, but it should have been legal, so I don't know what was going on there. The right hand signals in an always block have to be wires. No, they can be wires or registers. The always at pause edge clock neg edge set not. This statement has a problem. No, that statement's fine. Uh, it should be good. Uh, when we have a set not out of out of the sensitivity list. When, when we leave set a set not out of the sensitivity list, this means it is a synchronous set. Yes, that's correct. Active low synchronous set. 
It is a general rule to use non-blocking assignments in always blocks intended to be sequential. Yes, generally we do use non-blocking, but you'll notice in the uh, in the in the the, the practicum, I actually had uh, some blocking statements in one of my always blocks because I was summing things up and I needed one statement to complete before the next statement used the answer to the first statement and added uh, the third variable to that. Okay. Um, we can use the test uh, question mark uh, if true test colon uh, result if false uh, construct only in an always block. No, no, no. Uh, we can definitely use that outside always blocks. Uh, that's the uh, the question mark colon uh, syntax, and you can uh, and you can nest those two. Um, we can use case statements in or out of an always block. Nope, that's not true. They must be inside an always block. We can use if statements only in always blocks. Yes, that is correct. We can only use if statements in always blocks, but you can use them in an always block, and then they don't necessarily have to result. Uh, excuse me, in in a uh, in sequential logic. They could result in combinational logic. Okay. Uh, continuous assignment statements. They can be used for modeling combinational logic. Yes, that's usually what we do. Uh, they are outside procedural blocks, always in initial blocks. Yes, we generally put continuous assignment statements are outside the always blocks. The continuous assignment executes when any right side signal changes. Yes, that's correct. The left-hand side of a continuous assignment must be wire data type. Yes, it must be wire data type. It cannot be a register. Assign pound 5 carry sum equals A plus B. This is a continuous assignment. Yes, it is. The above statement has a 5 nanosecond inertial delay. Uh, yes, it does. The above statement has a 5 nanosecond transport delay. No, it does not. Assign pad. Uh, assign pad equals enable question mark data colon one tick bz. If enable is low, this will disconnect pad. So if enable is low, so the assign pad gets uh, gets disconnected if enable is low, that is correct. So if enable is low, it's zero, so that's gonna give a, uh, that's gonna have it evaluate to false. False is the second operand, one tick BZ. So that means you're, you're, uh, dis that you're sending it uh, to a high Z state or disconnected. The above statement could be used for a three state buffer. Yeah, it could. The Z value does not synthesize, it's only for simulation. So what do you think? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. All right, so that's that. Okay. So I that's kind of what I wanted to go over there. Um, let's see. I think what I'll do... Uh, that, that should give you a pretty good feel for what's going to be on it. Um, let's see, I had some more questions, but I think a lot of these are on here. What's the purpose of putting transport delays and inertial delays in your Verilog code? Well, we do that uh, so that we uh, we do that so that we absolutely uh, can get a reasonable simulation. It's all for simulation. List the advantages and disadvantages using an ASIC rather than FPJ for a project that requires a complex digital design. Well. So, primary advantage is ASICs are going to give you faster. You can uh, you can go through a whole number of prototypes. Uh, they're going to be expensive, but in smaller quantities, they're going to be quite a bit cheaper because you have that big one-time fee to fire up the foundry to do your chip. Um, if you're uh, uh, if you're trying to uh, get it out the door quickly, you definitely want to go with the FPGA. Um, if you're trying to uh, market a whole bunch of them and get it down to the cheapest price point you can, you're going to want to go with an application-specific integrated circuit. Um, if you're trying to get it, shrink it down to the smallest size, uh, then you're going to want to probably go with an application-specific integrated circuit. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, you can, um, 
if you're not making that many of them, then you definitely would probably want to go the FPGA route. Um, if your timing is super critical and pushing the limits, then you definitely want to go with an, uh, an ASIC. And if that's not the case, then um, then you could, and depending on how many you're going to make, you maybe could go with an FPGA. How, how big would a ROM have to be to hold 100 twos complement integers that could vary from minus 200 to minus 400? Okay, so so you have to hold 1,000, so 1024 ought to work, and uh, and you need uh, 401 different things, so that's 512. So basically, your ROM has to be uh, has to has to be uh, has to have uh, uh, 1,024 uh, words, and the words have to be uh, a total of nine bits. And and you would uh, your address lines would be uh, you'd have to have ten address lines. Um, and you'd have to have uh, nine output data lines. Okay. Answer a few questions about the Nexus Ford board. Okay, I think we already covered this. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna stop here. That's a pretty good uh, sort of taste of what you're gonna see on the quiz uh, or on the test rather. And so, um, so just. Uh, you can you can go over this video a couple times. That'll give you these are the kinds of things you ought to be studying. Those are the examples of questions I'm going to ask. Um, and uh, if you just review the lecture notes, I'm, I'll make sure everything that's covered in the test is in those notes somewhere. All right, or in those videos. All right, we'll talk to you all later, and uh, hang in there.